moving on. So that is all the process. Um, uh, now, how do we design these controls? That is the main, main focus that I want to bring in here in this slide. To whatever points that we spoke earlier, for example, the system modeling, you can see here, um, as an example, I have taken something like, there's a, a supply of a voltage. Uh, this could be like your um, power, the, the power that you get on the outlet. Um, um, and uh, you have a mo motor on the other side, you have some resistance in between, uh, um, and you're trying to basically control the speed of this motor that it's trying to run. And what we are trying to see here um, is you basically write some equation, um, a basic physics equation that you could you could um, you could with this uh, with such a such a simple circuit diagram that you have from your basic electrical um, uh, uh, background that you have from your uh, from your school. Um, and the next step, as I spoke, was so this is physics-based modeling on the left-hand side. So we will take an example in the later stage, but I just wanted to pictureize and bring down what is basically meaning uh, when you say plan system modeling and what do you mean by system identification? So what you do here is basically in the system identification, what you do is you step up the voltage from what you're supplying to this motor. So for example, you, do, you go from three volts to six volts. And then what happens to your motor in terms of regulating the speed? And you start to um, uh, gather some information and, uh, and design a plant from, from the data that you have. As I said, the plant and the system-based modeling is basically more physics oriented. And the system identification is when you don't have, or I can say this is a black box modeling. When I don't have, or when I don't understand much of how the physics is, or if I don't understand what the parameters of the system are, what you can start doing is something called a system identification, which is basically based on some test data. So what you have, what you're seeing here is what I'm doing is stepping up the voltage that the motor is supplied with. And then I can see that the motor is doing um, the control or, or the speed. It goes to a steady state. It starts with a zero speed and settles down at around 160 to 170 RPM. Um, and um, for that step voltage that I have done. And why is the RPM moving up and down is basically be, be, because the sensor is measuring this and what you will use some filters to actually get rid of that noise in the sensor measurement. And you basically design some, or you come up with basic equation, uh, which is what you see here is a first order system. When you step the voltage, it goes up and then stays at a steady state um, uh, RPM, right? And then this is designed as a first order equation. And this first order equation is what you will be using in controls. Um, to control it to a particular RPM that you need. So for example, you see on the left-hand side, somebody wants to control this to around say 130 RPM, right? Your control design is automatically varying the voltage supply uh, that you're seeing here um, that is sent to the motors. You can see that initially in order to catch up this um, motor speed, it supplies a full duty cycle, a hundred percent duty cycle and gets up to the speed. And once the, once you get enough on the motor speed, it tries to regulate um, the voltage supply to a lower value so that the motor speed settles down around 120 RPM or the targeted RPM that you need. Um, so here, what we are trying to use is there are some sensors from the motor, uh, which is basically a speed sensor. And we are trying to correct to a reference speed, which is basically you have a set speed of say 120 RPM. It takes what is the current speed of the motor and we basically see what the error is. And that error is basically sent to the controller and the controller controls this duty cycle or the voltage supply uh, and regulates that voltage supply that the motor is seeing so that it can be regulated to a particular speed that you need. So this is a simple motor control. Um, I'll go into detail in another example, but I just want to drive away here is, this is how some plant system modeling is done, which is basically you write some physics and physics-based equation or you can do it through a black box modeling when you don't understand this, is gather this data. Uh, we'll do this as an example for another system in detail. Um, uh, but I'm, what I'm showing here is, are the steps that we spoke about with some example. And you take that system, you put it in the plant, and you start designing this control. And you also use a sensor in, to give you a sense of feedback. And then you basically determine what the error between the reference signal and the actual speed signal and then your the controls is basically driving that voltage signal to drive the to drive the uh, motor rpm interesting now um just to take you guys into the space of 
uh, into the space actually. Um, um, literally what, what I'm showing here as an example is um, some satellite, right? So I've taken this from NASA. Um, some satellite is in the space, um, you no know, hovering um, in between sun and earth. Um, so this is all imaginary or uh, things are happening there, but I just want to drive away. Uh, how do we do some controls um, for a battery that is sitting on, in, on the satellite, right? Like, so you can see um, this satellite that is seeing that on one side, it is completely seeing what the sun is like. So the temperature of the batteries or the temperature that it's seeing on one end is um, basically very high. And on, on, on the other side, it's basically facing the earth and the rest of the space, which is basically on the colder edge, right? Now the battery is basically seeing extreme temperatures on one end of very hot and the extreme temperature of cold on the other side. Um, how do we um, go about controlling this battery to a particular temperature, um, uh, right? So that is what is my, you know, some basic drawing that I've heard. Um, so basically I'm seeing a deep space on one side, which is basically, you could imagine, it could be varying about in negative degree C on the higher side, on the other side, it's like 120 degree C or even higher, right? There's just some examples, but the target that uh, the systems team will come back and then say, hey, regulate the battery um, that the satellite has uh, about 10 to 30 degrees C, right? Um, in this example, I'm not, I'm not going deep into um, how do you, um, so for example, for the, uh, for the hotter temperature, how do you cool it down? But at least on the negative side, uh, when, you're, when the battery is seeing a colder temperature, how do you heat it up, right? Let's say, for example, they have a heater. So this is all example, I'm just, I'm just uh, taking it from the space, bringing it down to a very simple model um, that somebody, um, uh, so this is just to inspire you guys to basically do some controls design, uh, driving from the fact that the problem is in the space to something that you can bring on to your laptop, right? Like uh, what, what, where your system, your period trying to sit and design. Um, say these cells have a sensor, the, like the temperature probe, and then you have a, you have a heater strip right? Like basically some resistance based heater, um, you increase the resistance. It starts to heat up as you send current through that resistance and then it starts heating the battery. Um, right? Like, so again, our usual flow of controls that we have seen earlier are planned here. We are trying to control is basically a battery and you have a sensor that is like a temperature sensor. Uh, we have a control based on the, uh, based on uh, what the sensor measures, uh, the controller drives the fact, drives the heater, um, uh, say voltage the heater, or it could be like the PWM, uh, like a pulse width modulation duty cycle on the heater that it's trying to heat up um, the battery, right? At the same time, the batteries are also working, um, right? Uh, they are generating current, they'll generate its own Q. And there is also Q in and Q out, which is basically, I'm, I'm trying to picture here is um, the heat from the sun, um, that is coming in and on the other side, it's also generating heat out. Um, so the battery is going through several, um, generations of, um, heat from, uh, and also rejecting heat, um, as is, as it's also generating current, uh, and also what, what, what the ambient around it is, right? Um, let's see how we go about this problem. Um, so some basic physics, right? Like, um, just to do our first, as we discussed, we have some physics based modeling, right? Um, so just to understand as a controls engineer, I'm not going very deep into the, uh, what the thermal, thermal controls is, but I think from our bachelors and our school, we know that the heat transfer mechanisms can be like conduction, convection, and radiation. And there is basic physics, uh, equations that is already set up for such, right? Conduction is nothing, but there's a transfer of heat when there is physical interaction between materials. So anything like, um, for example, you heat a metal rod and the metal rod, throughout the metal rod, there is conduction. It's a solid rod and there are particles of atoms within the solid iron rod that you're heating on one side. Now the, the heat conducts itself through these particles on the solid, um, solid iron bar, right? So there is conduction. Convection is nothing but, um, so if, for example, that iron rod, and then now you start blowing some air on that iron rod. Now, as you cool using that, um, a fan or something, the fluid gains heat from this iron rod and then takes away that heat from the iron rod um, into the fluid and the fluid starts warming up. So there is a fluid inflow when you start talking about convection. Um, so conduction is just a solid rod and then there is conduction through the solid rod. Uh, 
Um, there's no uh, fluid that is in uh, fl uh, anything around that is flowing. Uh, say, for example, there's there's no um, there's no fan that is next to it, so it is basically just a rod, and you're heating it. Next, you put a fan in front, and then now there's a fluid that is taking away this heat. Now it becomes a convection, which is taking trying to take away heat and trying to raise the temperature. Radiation is when you have like, for example, in this case, we have sun that is trying to emit photons, and then now there's a transfer of heat coming from that high temperature objects. Um, and it starts to um, radiate heat. Uh, any, any, any high temperature, very high temperature object starts radiating heat, heat um, uh, out of it. And uh, what we're trying to capture is, um, um, in this case, we have some conduction that is happening because of the heater that you put on the battery and there's some radiation that is coming from the sun because it's a high temperature object that is trying to emit heat onto the battery. Let's go into the first step of um, modeling this basic convection and radiation. What you're seeing here is what I try to play around with is I have an Arduino board. I'm sure most of you have heard this. Um, what I have is basically I have two heaters, um, as, you see, as you see here, and trying to simulate that this is like kind of a sun. And I have some sensors um, um, or some heaters that like one is a heater, which is basically a heater output that you're trying to control the temperature. And uh, there is some temperature sensors, right? Like for example, to measure the temperature for, for my feedback. Um, this also has an LED to basically warn that uh, the temperatures are getting hot and don't touch the board, right? And I'm also trying to model this uh, parallelly. So this is basically your energy conservation equation, which is basically saying, so this is more towards thermal. Uh, and as we spoke, convection has an equation, radiation has an equation, and we are also trying to control this heater. And we are trying to regulate this temperature, which, uh, which we are trying to measure on the board here. And um, so this is, this is the settings that we are going to have. For example, the manufacturer gives you that the initial temperature, so for example, you are sitting in, in, in your house and then you have the initial temperature to be around 23 degrees C. The ambient is 23 degrees C. And the heater output is basically, my heater is saying zero to one watt is my, the capacity of the heater. And then you can control the zero to one watt, right? And then we are also using some, uh, so this is controlled using this alpha, what you see here. So if I say, 1%, then it goes to 1% heating, 1% of one kilowatt. Or if it is 100%, then it goes to one, one, one watt. I'm sorry, it's not kilowatt, it's watts. And then there is heat capacity, which is basically, heat capacity is where, where are we trying to use this is basically, this is the heater or the, the material that we are trying to heat up with, right? Like, and um, the, um, here we are using that material, which has a specific heat capacity, which is basically saying, if I increase, it needs 500 joules, to increase the temperature by one, one degree C, right? For that mass, for a unit mass of that system. Um, um, so that, that specific heat is, um, this is what we are trying to use here. And mass of the, um, the system that we are trying to heat up is basically this. So this will be used in, um, in this equation here. You have the mass, you have the specific heat, and uh, now coming on to the heating equations, which is basically your heat transfer equations, which is basically convection and the radiation. So, the convection is you have, or the, uh, you use the convection heat transfer coefficient. So because there is some ambient that is trying to take away the heat from, uh, from the system, right? And then we say the efficiency of that system, which is giving you that heat transfer is about 10 watt per meter square Kelvin, right? It takes away heat in this fashion. And then there is some radiation that is because of the heat around or the temperature around that is trying to um, radiate heat into, and then we use these constants. So this is all provided by manufacturer and we have this equation, right? So this, you can see by this equation itself that there is, this is a first order system. That is, um, it is a single derivative system and we are trying to derive what the temperature and predict what the temperature of the system. So you give a heater input and you have T infinity is basically what you see is your ambient, T zero is your, uh, so for this state, it needs to be, begin somewhere. Right? So you specify what this initial temperature is going to be and which becomes really important in this, in the controls problems. So you're comparing this temperature to the ambient and try to see how much of the convection is happening and exchange of heat with the ambient. And you're also trying to say that the radiation that is happening with the ambient is, is this equation where you have some emissivity, some Boltzmann constant, and what is the area of um, this heater that it's trying to basically do some radiation and we are trying to predict what this temperature of the heater as you control this input. 
of uh, of the heater from zero to one watt. So now I've con connected this board. So you can see these are the heaters here, um, right? And then I've connected uh, to my voltage supply. I've started to record onto my laptop on how the system behaves. Okay, so you can see this, I have three models. Uh, one is basically this hardware. Um, I'm trying to measure it on MATLAB Simulink. I'm trying to give the heater input to 40 uh, percentage, which is basically the uh, in this equation of zero to one, what I'll probably giving now is 0.4 watts, right? Um, you can see that this model, whatever is in the center, I'm using this one to predict the temperature. And this one is basically feeding the temperature from actual hardware because I have these sensors in that is measuring this temperature. On the other side is basically the physics based or the, um, the first order system model, which we'll go in detail, uh, which is basically identified through um, going back to this slide is basically through the system identification process. Okay, so we have three models in place. One is equation based which is basically what we discussed earlier. And the second is you have your actual hardware that is measuring when you give this input. And the other one is basically the system identification model, which I did not go through, um, but I'll, I'll show you in the next slide how we design this uh, linear model. Um, but this is my setup. Um, and trying to give this input to two, two of the models that we designed. And one is the basically the hardware and trying to measure and compare how this temperature. So what you see uh, on the left-hand side so hopefully it's readable by for everyone. Uh, the LO1 is the linear model. The blue line is your non-linear model, which is your equation. And the red line is your temperature control lab, which is basically my hardware, right? So you can see that we started with an initial temperature of 23 degrees C. So all you see here is basically this temperature scope that we are trying to measure here, right? Which is basically your temperature. So you can see that the initial temperature that you're starting with is around 23 to 25 degrees C, or I would say rather 23 degrees C because this is the 25 line, right? And we stepped up the heater input. So what we, we switch on the system, we directly go from zero to 40, right? And 40 is basically a 0.4 watts. Now the yellow line is, which we didn't discuss yet, which is basically a linear model, which is giving you some temperature output. And uh, the blue line, which is basically your equation that you model, um, and the red line is basically the actual hardware. So what this basically says is, see how close we are in terms of uh, prediction. So we are like, so hardware is saying we are 46 degrees C. Um, your um, um, models that you have modeled is one is saying uh, about 45 or 46, other is 47. And the, um, the actual or the linear uh, equation based model is saying 43, 44. So, what does basic modeling is already giving you is uh, you are within the limits uh, in, in terms of prediction um, um, and you're close enough, right? You're starting to close. So for, for example, you'll start tuning some of the parameters in this blue line, which is basically equation based to get to as close to what the actual hardware is doing, which is your red line is, is one of the tasks that you will see in this course is to tune some of the parameters that you have here. So when I say parameters is it is basically your heat transfer coefficient is different. Um, your Boltzmann constant is a, it's a constant, so uh, we can't do anything with that. So the parameters that you could play with is overall transfer heat transfer coefficient and some heat capacity. So probably the material has some deposits on 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 top of it that is trying to not to have so much of um, heat transfer. Um, so or whatever the whatever the supplier has specified uh, is different from what what you have used. So you will start playing around those parameters to make sure that. Um, uh, this blue line matches your red line. Um, and uh, let's discuss now about this um, uh, yellow line. This is my favorite, which is basically what I'm doing is, hey, I don't know any of the physics. Now I have to design. And I, as I spoke to you in the earlier slide, what I'm doing is I'm taking the red line, which you see here, right? Um, which is actually the temperature that the system is going through. And what I observe is when I give a step input of, um, uh, the heater, uh, it goes up and then it stays as a steady state. For example, it just goes uh, and settles down. Uh, it doesn't oscillate. Um, uh, it just basically goes to a steady state when I give a heater input. Um, such systems are basically what you call as first order systems. And first order systems can be basically represented um, in, in a basic equation. It's just uh, you have, so for example, let's start with this equation that you see on the right. 
uh, what I'm trying to say is the heater is basically your actuator input. So what you see on the bottom where I have given 40% heater input. Um, so you can basically, and we are trying to control is the temperature. And we can derive this um, coefficients of A and B just by seeing this data from, uh, from, from the measurement. Um, what this A and B is what I'm going to define, and I'll help you design this so that um, we have this, without, even without physics, we have this equation. So what you're seeing here, this A and B are basically, one by A is going to give you what is called as a time constant of the system, and B by A, uh, so when I basically divide this equation throughout by A, and then you have this equation below, which is basically one by A, this temperature derivative plus the temperature equals B by A times heater input, right? This B by A is basically is called as a gain, and this one by A is called as a time constant. So this is first order equation that you have when you represent this in a first order equation format, you have these, system, these coefficients that you can actually derive from the, um, the um, measurement that you see here. So B by A is nothing but when you step up the heater input by say for example, zero to 40 that we have done here, how is the variation of the output, which is B, which will measure on this measurement. And one by A is time constant, which is basically saying, when I do the step from zero to 40, how long does the, the system take to reach 60% of the steady state? For example, the steady state here, what you see is it, that is what my explanation here is, right? Like, so you are, you are starting with the initial temperature of 23 degrees C. And what is the steady state that you're seeing is about 46 degrees C. That is what I have mentioned here. And my time constant can be measured as 63% from the initial 23 degrees C, right? Which is basically 14.7, so 0.63 of 46.27 minus 23 is basically 14.7. And this 14.7 is added to 23 because that is our initial temperature that we started with. So what I'm saying here is the point at which the temperature reaches 37.7 degrees C is if you go back, uh, which is basically where my first cursor is, um, that 37, so for example, here, this 37. So what I'm seeing is the temperature at which, um, the time at which the temperature becomes 37.7, so which is basically this dot, right, uh, which is basically here, um, the first time uh, at which the temperature is 37.95 approximately uh, is about 120 seconds. So you, we have started at zero, and you can see we have run the simulation or the measurement on the Arduino hardware until 500 seconds, right? At 120 seconds, we reach 63% of the overall steady state or difference between the steady state and the initial, right? And that is what is known as the time constant of the system. Now, what I plug in is I plug in for this a value of A as 120 seconds. And the B by A, which uh, is the other constant that we are trying to define is when I supply from zero to 40, how is the temperature changing, right? Like it changed from 23 degrees to 46 degrees C. Now that means the gain is basically 0.58. So this gives you a basic, um, transfer function, the first order system transfer function, which is basically gain by time constant into S, which is the transfer, transfer function variable, which we'll go detail in our, in our courses, plus one. So what I'm saying is the temperature by heater input transfer function, when I say transfer function is nothing but for an input that you give, how does my output variable change? It's called as a transfer function, right? In this case, our output variable is our temperature and the input is our heater input and how this first order system behaves is defined by this and which we derived from basically some measurement that we have uh, recorded and nothing to do with physics, right? But so this, uh, this in association or in conjunction with physics can give you much more accurate results. Um, that is what you will see in the course. So you, what you are seeing now is we are independently modeling the equation, which is your blue line. Now, independently using the measurement, we have drawn this yellow line, which is coming from this equation and which we have taken the measurement from the, uh, from the data. And then we are trying to design this equation. And then the actual measurement is, is actually the red line, right? So this is how you have these three systems that are one is two, two models and then one is the hardware. So this is all I'm trying to prove here is a simple physics where we started actually is some satellite problem to battery and we started writing some equations and putting these parameters in. And then we started doing this in two ways. One is a gray box or a, or a black box modeling, which is your linear model, which is a first order system. 
and then you do, did a nonlinear model it's a, um, by, based on the equation, and then you actually connect it to the hardware. And then now we are close enough in our results. So now my next task is, how do I regulate to whatever temperature that I need? So this is open loop, right? You give 40% input, the system is doing what, what it is. And we are trying to gather what the system is doing. And um, what we wanted to do is, I want to regulate this to 35 degrees C, or I want to regulate this to a 40 degrees C. Now, how do, how do I design this PID gains? Uh, when I say PID is a proportional integral derivative, and uh, we use some tools to design uh, this gains for the PID. Um, so this is some quick overview on plant analysis. So we do some frequency response. We'll go in detail when you come join the course. We are doing some time response. We are doing some stability. So all these controls needs to be stable. Uh, what happens if you, if you give an actuator input and the controls, uh, the temperature goes crazy? Uh, uh, beyond control, um, it goes to high high temperature levels. Now I need to bring that system into a stable temperature control. How do you design? You want to check whether the given plant model here our plant is basically that heater and uh, the, the the temperature that it's coming out uh, as we heat up, right? And we have modeled that temperature for the heater input. Now what that whole plant is basically um, is is unstable system, uh, and uh, we want to do some stability analysis. Um, so we use some Bode plots here to kind of do uh, how is the system, so this is, how is the system basically responding as, so you remember the, the throttle input that I was talking about, which is basically frequency based analysis, right? Uh, when you give the throttle at a high frequency, how does the system behave? And at a low frequency, how does the system behave? So what you see is a frequency scale. Uh, at low input systems, the system is behaving in one way. At high input systems, the system is behaving in a different way. So we are trying to basically gather these from the, the data that we have measured. And uh, what we are doing in the next step is um, designing this game, um, which is basically is the whole of the controls is about. I'm designing this KP, uh, KI, and KD, uh, or in this case, I'm just using the proportional and integral um, control. I'm deriving those gains to control the actuator in such a way that it can um, it can regulate the temperature. So we'll go in detail in the course work of how do you use some of the tracking tools or analysis tools to um, control the temperature at the desired range. And uh, as in how fast do you want to get the control temperature to control? Um, for example, you're starting uh, at zero and I want the temperature to be controlled in 50 seconds. I want the temperature to be controlled or to a target in 10 seconds or in 100 seconds. So as I, as I spoke earlier, the requirements are going to flow to you as a controls engineer, and you are going to design this um, uh, to say that I need, so the, the requirements will say design this in such a way that the control regulates the temperature uh, of 50 degrees C always in the battery. And this regulation should be within the bounds. That means I should not cross beyond 51 degrees C. I should not cross beyond 49 degrees C. So they are going to give you this um, bounds of um, uh, the temperature to be controlled. It also gives you the time at which the temperature needs to be controlled within if you're starting from an initial condition and all those becomes a part of your controls requirements. Um, so I have designed some controls on the left hand side using some analysis, which will go deeper, deeper again in our controls courses uh, or in this coursework. And what I see is basically here, my target is to regulate this temperature to 40 degrees C, right? That is what you're seeing. So the blue line, what you're seeing is basically how my, um, uh, heater input is regulated, right? And what you see, um, the green one is your temperature as a linear model, which is basically based on your, um, the system identification or the black box modeling. And uh, what you see, the red line is our hardware and our set point of temperature is 40 degrees C. And the blue line is basically, as I spoke, is the heater input. So what it does, as we saw earlier, is it starts with 23 degrees C, just to bring this temperature close to 40 degrees C, you can see that a heater input is highly, is, is high. It's, it's running at full capacity to bring the temperatures up. And once it reaches the higher temperature, it starts derating itself to zero degrees C. And then um, it starts controlling and regulating to a steady state control. So what you, what you can finally see is when I give my heater inputs to a steady state of 20%, I'm able to regulate for that ambient, I'm able to regulate that to 40 degrees C that we see. Um, so that's, that's awesome. So you have designed all this and gathered all this from some of the design tools that MATLAB, Simulink, and controls courses that controls uh, is going to say and 
we have come up with these gains and these gains are what I'm using here to control this to a particular temperature. And you are doing all this for this satellite problem that you saw as a simple way to start with just sitting in your laptop and trying to measure and bring up some model. And this is a good model. So here you can see that model. 40% um, is my input and I'm measuring some feedback of the sensor temperature and feeding that back to my PID and I'm tuning these gains and then I'm setting. So this is the hardware. And uh, what is this is the transfer function that we derived from the previous step, uh, which is basically this transfer function 0.58 by 120 S plus one is what is fed in this uh, model here. And I'm trying to compare what this hardware is doing to, to what I have designed as a system, uh, a system based on system identification or the black box modeling. And I uh, have given that initial temperature of 23 degrees C. And then I'm trying to do, uh, and you can see the differences are not much and it's a good start for your controls. I would say this is, um, it gives you a start. I'm sure there is more to add, but it at least gives you a ballpark gains. Is this gains in order of hundred order of thousands, but I can start with some gains that my model is given. Now go sit in the car. Say for example, this, this heater is basically inside the car heating your high voltage battery in an electric car then you can use these gains straight forward and then go and apply it in the car. And then you are not, you are not off by um, a lot. So this is how a controls engineer takes the problem of a uh, real hardware to your desktop, design the gains, go back to your car and implement these gains and then test it in the car. Um, so yeah, so that comes to the end of the satellite battery temperature control problem. Um, this is just into the future. I'm just trying to give how much, controls is there um, in the in the field right now. For example, the autonomous vehicle control. Um, uh, there's perception like the laser uh, LIDAR um, and the cameras are seeing and trying to give you this information of what speed profile that you have to go. And uh, as you drive, the speed profile is converting into a longitudinal problem and the lateral control problem, which is basically you're trying to control what your throttle needs to do, what your steering needs to do. Um, and uh, this is one of the controls that I enjoy. Um, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to show you the scale of how the controls is applied. Now there is autonomous controls coming everywhere. And I'm trying to show you um, uh, implication. You know, when you learn this, where it is implied later in your future, um, you can start off with a basic battery temperature control or a motor control, go on until something like autonomous control like this. Um, so you can see that. Um, these are various modules in autonomous control. There is some mapping, there's some perception, there's motion planning. All of this gives you information to controls for like a speed profile to, con to, to regulate or the path to con uh, control. So for example, it is, you are doing this, your steering and the steering actuation is automatically happening in your autonomous control. Uh, so this is the Google car, um, uh, the Stanford uh, car that, um, that was the first uh, of uh, autonomous cars that was built on road. Uh, yeah, and tested. So they use some of the uh, such an architecture and we see that controls play a big role here, in here. I'm sure uh, there are followers of Elon Musk uh, from Tesla. I'm a, I'm a big follower. So there is, he, there's a company called Neuralink that he's come, 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 come up with, which is basically trying to use controls again. Um, what he's trying to do is place a small chip on your skull and trying to regulate um, uh, the nerve pulses. So basically, your as as we spoke in our the first example, as I showed you the insulin um, liver pancreas problem, you can start to regulate uh, the new nerves that is sending these electric pulses, right? And trying to control some mu muscles in the body. And you can see the hardware that he's trying to use, and it has the sensors uh, like the IMU temperature pressure sensors, and uh, trying to control some of the problems that you see on the right. So. Um, something like somebody who is paralyzed, say the probably the nerve uh, which is controlling some of the muscles as, is paralyzed, right? And then um, what what he does is put this um, uh, a simple uh, control uh, chip on your on the skull and trying to control the electrodes and give pulses on to those nerves, which stimulates this uh, muscles. So what you're trying to see is your muscle, your nerve is basically your, uh, or the one which is basically sending your pulses, electric pulses is your um, actuator and, uh, and you're moving your muscles up and down, right? Uh, so wherever is the problem, you try to um, regulate or use controls to stimulate those. And uh, Neuralink is one of the examples. So when you're, once you come into the field, probably this becomes more 
more um, more available and some of you maybe started to starting to work on these so that's why i'm trying to show how far does the controls go into probably you have um, you have seen um, the spacex launch so recently they went back to uh, iss and then brought humans back um, uh, from space and then it has some of the uh, actuators like the the draco th thrusters which is basically trying to control this capsule in space and it also has um, evacuation in in uh, when you say when you're sitting in in the on the rocket right trying to launch and there's there is some fault in the launch vehicle right and then this capsule where the astronauts are sitting needs to eject off and then it has some of the actuators and you can see those some of those actuators are here in in design um, so as a controls engineer you will start to play around with these actuators maybe in the future right so there is controls everywhere right from the space to your um, bio in, in, in your in your in your body and in autonomous controls so yeah so so the controls is everywhere is what my point is and some some uh, something to the future in terms of controls right like there is model predictive control there is some gain scheduling there is state estimation kalman filter so what happens is uh, sometimes you can't place a sensor where you want and then you need to estimate the state uh, of the system by doing some modeling modeling of the plant and you do use something called kalman filter estimations in in such places yeah so some now there is artificial intelligence reinforcement learning which is trying to adapt to what is happening uh, uh, and trying to learn and uh, modify and learn the system as well right so you can use such control uh, use such such techniques to also drive your controls so this is this is what is uh, the future of controls that that some of you might uh, who 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 are interested in coming to the field would be looking for and as a controls engineer uh, these are some of the career paths that you will be seeing so as i as i saw as i spoke requirements engineer there is controls development controls testing there is validation engineer for all this cell mill hill pill that we spoke about and there is some systems engineer um, uh, who is who is helping controls to design um, some of the controls uh, in 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 conjugation right so these are some of the career path opportunities that you will have um, uh, as part of that.